can take a few minutes to let a few people get in here and uh, get seated. Awesome. Good morning, all my friends, and welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Alton. Welcome to you here in the sanctuary, and for those of you at home, everybody wave hi. Okay. I'm Robin Berkeley. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the president of this congregation, and I also serve as a worship associate. For those of you new to our church, we are a small congregation in Alton, Illinois, spiritually led by the Reverend Krista Taves, who will be in the pulpit for the first time on July 17th. I'm so glad that you are here, whether you are in the sanctuary or online. We welcome everyone to this home of comfort, spirit, justice, and hope. We are Unitarian Universalists. We open our service with a prelude by our accompanist, Joy. Joy. We have uh, some new songs that we're going to be doing today, so be, we'll be gentle with us, okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Once through first, okay, good. So we're, 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 we're having some fun with some new tunes, so let's see how that goes for us. Anyway, welcome. So an important ritual in the Unitarian Universalist faith, faith is the lighting of our chalice. Unitarian Universalists have many different interpretations of the flaming chalice, including the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. Join me in celebrating all of these reasons and more. If you're watching elsewhere and have a chalice or candle, please light it now as we all join in saying the unison words projected on the screen. We hallow this time together by kindling the lamp of our heritage. Our opening prayer is number 418 in the Gray Hymnal, adapted from Israel Zangwill. Come into the circle of love and justice. Come into the community of mercy, holiness, and health. Come, and you shall know peace and joy. Please rise and body your spirit as you are able and join us in our opening hymn, which is new to us, The Bells of Equality, which is written by UU songwriter Grace Lewis McLaren. Thank you. 
Please be seated. <clears throat> our goal each week is to consider how our weekly message connects with our UU principles. I think profoundly our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of all humans, is what resonates today with my message, we are not a theocracy. These words, these words directly from the UUA help to establish the link between the message and the principle. Our Unitarian Universalist faith affirms that all of our bodies are sacred and that we are each endowed with the twin gifts of agency and conscience. Each of us should have the power to decide what does and doesn't happen to our bodies at every moment of our lives because consent and bodily autonomy are holy. And when disparities in resources or freedoms make it more difficult for certain groups of people to exercise autonomy over their bodies, our faith compels us to take liberatory action. Because we are not a theocracy, principles two and four are also important. Number two encourages us to work towards justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. And number four asks us for a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Supporting bodily autonomy is a radical form of justice, equity, and compassion, but an essential one. And because we are not a theocracy, by definition, we have to support everyone's search for truth and meaning, allowing for individual conscience and individual paths and not imposing your religion on someone else. I'm not mincing words today, people. I hope you would not expect anything less from me. <laughs> Amen. But we're going to act, and we have to support these principles in, in, in action, and that's what today's message will be about. So thank you. As part of our weekly worship service, we take time for the expression of joys, concerns, or sorrows. Today there are some electric candles up here in the front. I invite anyone who would like to light a candle representing whatever's in their heart or thoughts to come forward, practicing social distancing as much as we can, not that we have to worry. There's a Lots of space here, right? And, and to light a candle. So if you want to come up this way and exit that way to light the candle, I do want to take a moment to please ask everybody to put uh, Ron Glossop in your prayers because he lost his wife this week, for those who may not have known or may not know him. Um, so Audrey died. She was in hospice. So uh, we'll keep uh, him in our thoughts. We will keep all sorts of important people in our thoughts today. So please welcome. If you want to light a candle, please do. It's no surprise that we all are feeling a lot of stress because the state of the world, the state of our country, um, is going through a really tough time. We've still got a war in the Ukraine. Hopefully we'll be managed somehow, but obviously there's some challenges out there. We've had gun violence that continues, although I'm heartened by at least a small incremental move towards um, addressing you know, gun control, um, surprising that we got, it took us this long to just even do something incremental. Supreme Court rulings blurring that boundary between church and state. Supreme Court 
cutting down individual rights to have bodily autonomy, supporting individual rights to hold guns if they want to, but not for me to manage my own body. I don't feel like I am a full citizen in this country at this point in my life, particularly since you know that where they're coming from. I'm going to get ahead of myself on my message. So I just want us to sit for a moment. Thank you for that meditative space, but also to just sit in some quiet for a moment. Close our eyes. Send the meta in our hearts, the best wishes out to those who need it, to the world, to our friends, to our neighbors, to people we know and people we don't know. All right, we have another new hymn. What Would Happen If, also written by Grace Lewis McLaren. So the next hymn, we'll let Joy play it through once, and then we did pretty good in the first one, so let's see what we can do with this one. Thank you very much. She does a really wonderful job every week. That's good. I like that. Good. She's making changes. Like it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Really, I just appreciate always the music that you choose. It's wonderful. It's one less stressor in my life. I go, John, just, this is what we're doing. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Two readings today. Our first reading is from Marge Piercy, The Right to Life, written in 1980. A woman is not a pear tree thrusting her fruit into mindless fecundity into the world. Even pear trees bear heavily one year and rest and grow the next. An orchard gone wild drops few warm rotting fruit in the grass, but the trees stretch high and wiry gifting the birds 40 feet up among inch-long thorns broken atavistically from the smooth wood. A woman is not a basket you place your buns in to keep them warm, not a brood hen you can slip duck eggs under. 
not the purse holding the coins of your descendants till you spend them in wars, not a bank where your genes gather interest and in inter in interesting mutations in the tainted rain any more than you are. You plant corn and you harvest it to eat or sell. You put the lamb in the pasture to fatten and haul it to butcher it for chops. You slice the mountain in two for a road and gouge the high plains for coal and the waters run muddy for miles and years. Fish die, but you do not call them yours unless you wish to eat them. Now you legislate mineral rights in a woman. You lay claim to her pastures for grazing, fields for growing babies like iceberg lettuce. You value children so dearly that none ever go hungry. None weep with no one to tend them when mothers work. None lack fresh fruit. None chew lead or cough to death, and your orphanages are empty. Every noon, the best restaurants serve poor children's steaks. At this moment, at 9 o'clock, a parterra is performing a tabletop abortion on an unwed mother in Texas who can't get Medicaid any longer. In five days, she will die of tetanus, and her little daughter will cry and be taken away. Next door, a husband and wife are sticking pins in the sun they do not want. They will explain for hours how wicked he is, how he wants discipline. We are all born of women. In the rows of the room, we suckled our mother's blood, and every baby born has a right to love like a seedling to sun. Every baby born unloved, unwanted, is a bill that will come due in 20 years with interest, an anger that must find a target, a pain that will beget pain. A decade downstream, a child screams, a mother falls, a synagogue is torched, a firing squad is summoned, a button is pushed, and the world burns. I will choose what enters me, what becomes of my flesh. Without choice, no politics, no ethics lives. I am not your cornfield, not your uranium mine, not your calf for fattening, not your cow for milking. You may not use me as your factory. Priests and legislators do not hold shares in my womb or my mind. This is my body. If I give it to you, I want it back. My life is a non-negotiable demand. And it's sort of profound. This was written in 1980 because it really resonates today. <clears throat> Our second reading is really a story, a, a testimony that I actually saw um, on a Facebook page for uh, a, a musician. Her name is Amanda Palmer. She plays, uh, I guess, the ukulele. Um, and she had a Facebook post that she put up about um, a reflection of an experience that she had. I pulled out my phone and got a shot of him as I drove away, and he was walking to his car. I was at the Planned Parenthood benefit in Woodstock. It was like 300 people in a tent, in a field, outside a nice house on a hill. Everyone was drinking wine and eating nice food. It was an expensive ticket. It was mostly older people. A woman spoke about the future of reproductive rights. Then I got up on the little stage and talked for about 10 minutes about the tour that I was on, my abortion stories, and then I played the ukulele. I joked to the audience that it wasn't the kind of crowd that I was going to make people raise their hands if they'd had an abortion. But then a woman in her 60s raised her hand anyway. And then I said, fuck it. Okay, I'll ask. Then all the people started raising their hands. Then at the end of the event, outside the tent, a man came up to me and said there was one question that I didn't ask. He was maybe 70. And I said, what was that question? And he said, you didn't ask how many men took women to illegal abortions and then watched them die. And then I held him in my arms. And that still gets me. I guess the, the message for both of those readings is, you know, women have autonomy and men, you know, are not devoid of that pain that we're feeling. And that there's no, there's nobody that's untouched by this radical change in perspective of what's going on in society today. Men and women equally are affected by this. <clears throat> okay, give me a second here. So, <clears throat> my message for the today. Um, it was funny, when, when this all kind of went down, 
Sabrina Trupia, as many of you know, is a member of our congregation and just finished seminary. And, and she said, those of you that are going to be in the pulpit this Sunday, she goes, flames of fire, you know, or some equivalent of that. And I'm like, I will be on the third. I said, I promise to keep the flames afloat. <laughs> um, it's hard, boy, I'll tell you. So my sermon's going to pull a kind of tit, some tidbits from some past sermons that I've given, um, but, but more like as, remember when I said this? Remember when I said that? And sort of pulling it all together here today. So um, how many have you have ever seen the vagina monologues? You've probably heard about it, but some of us have seen it. Some of us have performed in it. I've actually done that. It's been a lot of, it's, it's a lot of fun. For those of you that are not familiar with the vagina monologues, it was written by Eve Ensler as a way of empowering women. And it, it deals with some provocative, provocative topics, all centered around the vagina. That is what is uniquely, um, it, it, in, in, in the past, it's been a uniquely feminine thing. And again, we recognize this. This is sort of a, it's, it sounds transphobic when we say this, and I want to take a step back and recognize that there are men that have uteruses. So while it was originally written to empower women, I would, I would like to argue that this is written now to empower anybody with a uterus and what they experience and the pain and the suffering that they experience around that. A good friend of mine, Joan Lipkin, uh, right before the pandemic, did a trans woman focused or and a trans man focused uh, a vagina monologue story. They had trans women and trans men perform the the the, the theater, and it was stunning. Um, and she did a, an, an amazing job, and I love that she was inclusive in that. So the vagina monologues, though, deal with some really tough topics. They deal with transgender issues now more so, um, but it also deals with issues of rape and this and sex for pleasure which is still being shamed in this moment by anybody that says, just close your legs if you don't want to get pregnant. Okay. It also deals with things like trafficking, and it deals with abortion rights and abortion access. And it's, it's challenging. And I performed probably three different shows of the Vagina Monologues when I was in upstate New York. Um, it was, um, and I'm proud of all of those performances. But the one that was really memorable for me um, I was doing a performance called The Angry Vagina. And, uh, and, it's, and, and you have the notes in front of you. You don't have to memorize these things because we're all amateurs. And so, um, you know, the, the basically the way that the piece goes is you storm on stage with no introduction. You go, my vagina's angry at the top of your lungs. So, and I got laryngitis the day before I was supposed to do it. <laughs> Needless to say, because I came out and I went, my vagina's angry. It really is. <laughs> so I have a great fond memory of doing that. But it's a powerful piece because it talks about the misinformation that's out there that people truly don't understand women and our physiology and why things happen the way they happen. All you need to do is listen to the insane politicians. And I am not mincing words today. The insane politicians out there that think that women don't, they don't, clearly don't understand how women's bodies work. Like, well, doesn't your body just shut down if you're getting raped? No, it doesn't. You know, well, you know. Anyway, I could go on. So I'm going to take a breather here because I'm already pissed off about what's going on next door. Don't even get me started. <laughs> we'll get there to another conversation at the end of this, end of this. But let me go back to my theme. Because that angry vagina is me right now. I'm an angry vagina. I am an angry human being. I am an angry woman. I am angry. We are not a theocracy. We are not a theocracy. John Adams said the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Thomas Jefferson said, history, I believe, furnishes no example of a priest-ridden people maintaining a free civil government. James Madison says, an alliance or coalition between government and religion cannot be too carefully guarded against. And Thomas Paine says, of all the systems of religion that ever were invented, there is none more derogatory to the Almighty more unedifying to man, more repugnant to reason, and more contradictory in itself than this thing called Christianity. 
Now, I'm not here to slam Christianity. I, I'm not. That's not my goal because people can believe whatever they want to believe. But these are our founding fathers. They had a voice in what our country was supposed to be like. And it's obvious. It's obvious that this is not a theocracy. It's never meant to be. It wasn't Christian founded. So many, if you remember from a sermon that I did a number of years ago, so many of our founders were Unitarian Universalists. If not in membership, certainly in espoused values and beliefs. Read anything written by Ben Franklin. While he was a Quaker in practice, he was a UU in his heart. Thomas Jefferson as well. Not explicitly a UU, but clearly a UU in his values. Our country's values are UU values and is how it should be. You don't get to tell me what I should do with my body. If you think it's wrong, then that's between me and whatever divine being I believe in or not. That's on me. And, and I will admit, right, our founding fathers had flaws. The slavery thing, big issue. I get it. We are flawed. They were flawed. I do appreciate, though, that they strived to do the right thing. And they were victims themselves of a time and a point of view that was challenging. But we are not a theocracy. Our religious beliefs cannot be imposed on another. Jews believe that life begins at first breath, that the mother's life is always sacrosanct over that of the unborn child, that when the choice is being made, it's to save the mother, that the mother's needs, the living, breathing human being that walks on this planet, not a potential life, but an actual life matters. Many faith traditions, including our own, share this belief. But this is about bodily autonomy. And I, and I will say, there, there may be people sitting in this room that don't necessarily share that, that they truly believe once, that, that once there's fertilization and conception, that that's a life. And you know what? I honor and respect your point of view on that. And it's important for you to know that if that's your choice, I've got your back. But if that's not what you believe, I also have your back because it's not my business. It's for you to believe what you want to believe. We can't believe that one religion is better than another. That's really the foundation of what we do as universalists, right? That there's multiple paths to truth, that there's multiple ways to seek the divine. We, as a faith tradition, we value a person's path to their own truth based on their values and their conscience. And what I choose to do for me is not what I would impose on anybody else. I believe in the primacy of bodily autonomy. And I know this may be controversial with many people, and, and, I'm, and I want to be careful in how I say this. For me, bodily autonomy wins. I struggled with vaccine mandates because I also believe that I have the right to do with what my body with what I want to. So a vaccine mandate, I understand that. Now, personally, do I would I not have a vaccine? 100 percent, no way. I, I, and I just got over COVID. I've had two vaccines, two boosters. I believe in vaccines. I believe in science. But I also know that there are people that I love dearly who are like, no, I don't want a vaccine. Okay, then we, we recognize you understand the boundaries and the risks for that. So I am 100% about bodily autonomy, and I strive to be consistent in that across the board. One of the reasons why we require masks in here is because I want someone who is unvaccinated to feel like this is still a good place for them, that they're welcome here. But they have to wear a mask, like we all do, to protect each other, to protect the most vulnerable, because this is foundationally what we do as Unitarian Universalists. It's why we have the mask mandate in here, right? This is a nuanced and complex issue for a lot of people. 
sort of when does viable life begin? Who advocates for the unborn? Should someone, should someone advocate for them? I don't have answers to that. All I know is it's complex. And I've had these complex, in-depth conversations with people whom I respect deeply, who believe in science deeply, and who are social justice warriors, and they, that matters to them deeply. And it's, and, it's, and it's a challenging, not simple, not black and white question. What is black and white for me is my body, my choice, period. But if the foundation for an anti-choice, anti-abortion, anti-bodily autonomy movement is based on religion, which is what we're seeing now, which religion, which beliefs matter? Right? Jews don't say, huh, I don't get to eat pork or you know, shrimp, so you shouldn't. No, but that's not how evangelists think about it. Evangelists want everybody to believe what they believe. They believe it is their God-given right to impose that on other people. They baptize people in absentia. We see this with a whole bunch of faith traditions. Someone's autonomy is taken away from them by that simple act. When I was alive, I made a choice about what I believe. Do not, under any circumstances, upon my death, violate what I believe in. Don't violate my body while I'm alive, but definitely don't do it while I'm dead because I will come back and haunt you. That's what I told my sister, because she's a part of the LDS church. And I said, you know, I will come back and haunt you if you ever do that to me, if I die before you do. She goes, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. When I was in college, I did a paper on, well, it's in a, in a logic class, or a philosophy of logic or whatever class. And to reason through the abortion question, I decided if I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go for it big, right? <laughs> And of course, this is no small feat since I went to a Catholic Jesuit college called Marquette University. And I went into it and I said to the teacher, I said, this is what I want to do. And they're like, go for it. That's what I loved about the Jesuits. Like they had a belief system, but they're like, you want to challenge it? Go for it. I want to see what you come up with. Let's talk about it. They really challenged this notion of at least a, a, a church that I, that the people that I ex were exposed to at Marquette University were really about learn, grow, think critically, make a decision for yourself. So I did that. And my reasoning brought me to a conclusion that even if I had, even if I've long forgotten the nuances of my argument, I fully supported bodily autonomy, that I fully supported choice, that if a baby could not survive outside of the mother's womb, it was not alive, it was not viable, and the mother's body choices and autonomy was sacrosanct. That's the conclusion I drew from it. After reasoning on both sides, going down this path, going down this path, this detailed paper, and I got an A on it because I made the argument and it made sense to me. Like I said, the nuances, I don't remember now. It's just so ingrained in who I am and the way I think about things that I don't, I don't even think about it anymore. I have great privilege. I've never, ever had to make that choice. I'm, I, I'm blessed. I'm, I, I, hate to, I hate to say that, blessed. I'm fortunate because nobody blessed me. I am lucky. I am fortunate. I am privileged that I never had to make that choice. And I don't know if I would have or wouldn't have. I'd like to say, oh, well, you know, mm -mm. I know better because there's plenty of times I had a line in the sand and then the world happened and I went, mm -hmm. maybe that line is not so reasonable. Because as, as a reasonable person who's a critical thinker, I push back the boundaries of like the, 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 the black and white solid line. There's very little in my life where I said, mm -mm, this line doesn't get crossed. Because I try very hard to live in a sort of a balanced way of thinking about things. And often if someone says to me, yeah, it's pretty hardcore, I'm like, tell me why you believe something different. Let me know. Because that will help me to learn and grow. Right? Anyway. I'm not sure what I would have done, and I'm not going to try to hazard a guess because hindsight's always 2020. But if I were faced with it, I really don't know what I would have done. I might have had to make a choice that was hard. And guess what? Both choices are hard. All, 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 all multiple choices. Ending the pregnancy, 
ending it, uh, keeping it and giving it up for adoption or choosing to raise a child on my own. You know, all those choices are painful and no one, the government, religion, doesn't get to tell people what they should do because we do not live in a theocracy. One religion does not decide for everyone how they should live their lives. Religion is about personal beliefs and standards against which we hold ourselves. With the multitude of religions out there, which religion's rules should dictate how we should live our lives? My religion is about what I am supposed to do, about what my religion calls me to do. In order to live in peace and harmony, other people in other religions should hold themselves to their own standards and stop imposing their beliefs on others. So now what? Where do we go from here? What do we do? Well, Paula and Cheryl and I, we went to see Santana on Friday night. And we loved it. We had a great time. We danced our little butts off. <laughs> and one of the things that Carlos Santana said in the middle of the concert, which had us on our, our feet screaming and yelling, he said, we should not be weapons of mass destruction. We have to be weapons of mass compassion. And we love that. And he's just, he's just this amazing social justice warrior, and he's been doing this for 50-plus years and continues to do the right thing. His faith, his beliefs, his, his standards are just stunning to me. So I agree with this. I think that's the starting point. We have to be weapons of mass mass compassion. And then I'm going to go back to another sermon that I did probably about a year ago about Desmond Tutu, eh, not less than a year, where I said, as Desmond Tutu said, sometimes we have to pull people out of the river and sometimes we have to go upstream to stop people from falling in the river in the first place. Where does this leave us? What should we be doing? Well, number one, we got to pull people out of the river because right now there are people drowning. And it's our job to provide the support that we can in any way that we can. Inaction is not an option. It's not. Donate to abortion funds. Yes, I said that out loud. Donate to abortion funds. If you need some sources, resources on that, come talk to me after service. I'm happy to share with you where I have joined to become a member and where I will continue to do donations. I also am trying to hatch a plan, which I will not discuss here in the pulpit where it's open to public conversation. But once the service is over, if anybody wants to gather and talk with me about what my plan is, we've got a good plan. We're going to try to do this. Our goal is to do what we can in the moment to help the drowning drive people to clinics across state lines if you need to. I, I encourage you to do what your conscience tells you to do. But we also need to stop people from falling in the river in the first place. What do we need to do for that? Teaching owl. It still remains the single most blessed thing that I do. Every single time I teach a class, it's about teaching kids consent. It's about teaching kids bodily autonomy. It's about making sure our kids don't experience what I experienced, where they know what their options are. The last time I, saw, I taught a class with Juliet, we were teaching it at First Church in St. Louis, and we had kids upset when stuff started coming down through Texas and we knew that things were coming through for the Supreme Court with the Mississippi case and they were upset and they were angry they were furious so that's one way that I choose to help people from stop falling in the river every single kid comes out of that class knowing as a male or as let me correct that, sorry, as someone with a penis and someone that doesn't have a penis, how to put a condom on a penis. They have to know. They have to advocate for themselves. They have to protect themselves. 
They have to know about skin hunger. They have to know that their body is going to betray them. Even if their head says no, their body wants it. And they need to know how to be consistent in how they handle that and to be, to be prepared for that experience. That if you are raped in your body orgasms, I'm sorry, I'm going to be provocative here today, but if you're raped in your body orgasms, that doesn't mean you liked it. It's just a bodily response, like any kind of fight or flight or fawn or freeze response. It's a bodily response that we don't have control over. We have to work for change at the top. And we have to vote for candidates that support our values consistently, passionately. We have to you you the vote in the fall as we sit at some upcoming Pride events, Tower Grove Pride, here in Alton Pride. We should be doing votes registration, helping people to register to vote because we need to get the young people voting and understanding that this is a dangerous time. My daughter was in a ball on her bed crying. It's just the state of the world is so depressing, I feel hopeless. I said, feeling stress is one thing, but channel that. Channel that into action. Vote. Do the things. Volunteer. I said, can we host people at our house, Margaret? She's like, yes, we will host people here, and I will help. So we may host people. We'll see. And I'm not unafraid. I'm not afraid to say that. I will host people, and I will help them. We have to do more than the performative nonsense that many of us do, including myself. We have to do more. We have to do concerted action. We have to fight metaphorically for the country that we love. We have to fight for our rights because they're coming for all of us. If you think because you are male and white and straight and you're not of, a, of a, an, an inclination to reproduce, you think that doesn't apply to you? It does, because they're coming for birth control. They're coming for our rights for bodily autonomy and personal choice. They're coming for our LGBTQIA siblings. They are blurring the lines between church and state, removing constraints on gun use. I'm heartened, as I said, about the new gun laws, but it's only the beginning, and there's so much more to do. It isn't enough to sit in your seat and say, what a shame, I'm so mad. Because this is a watershed moment and we have to do whatever we can right here and right now. We need to honor human dignity. We need to support our search for truth and meaning. We need to draw a line in the sand and be role models about how we think the world should be because our founding fathers were Unitarians. This country's values are our values. And the only way we can do that is to fight for it, to vote for it, to be the role model that we are asked to be. So today, when you go home, I want you to make a plan for one thing. I don't care what it is. One thing that you're going to do to make a difference in this fight. It doesn't have to be big. It just has to be a thing. Because remember what Edward Everett said, you know, Edward, Edward, Ever it pale says, maybe it's a long time that word. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And that something, no matter how big or small, is going to matter. And I can't not do that. I am, I have to do something. Blessed be. Okay, our final hymn. One by one. There we go.
Thank you. Right, Lane, if you don't mind passing around the basket, thank you. As Lane passes the offering basket, I want to, want to remind you that we're closing on our stewardship campaign. This is the hardest part of my job. This really is. I mean, I like doing fundraising, but this is still hard work. We set a goal of $70,000. We knew it would be a stretch because inflation's out of control, gas is outrageous, and it's priced at an all-time high. I get it. 100%. We wanted to inspire people to donate given our plans for next year. Let me give you some numbers ahead of the game. Last year we pledged $54,320 and we exceeded that at the end of the day. We received at the end of the day in pledges, people pushed above and beyond what they could donate. We finished out with $59,653. That's pretty stinking awesome. So that was over 5,000 more than we had people pledge. Currently, our pledge level is at 58,420. I hope we can push this a little bit more in the next few days before we close. I know things, a lot of things are up in the air, particularly stay or go, although I'm, I'm mad. But our upcoming conversation is going to be on July 17th. It's going to be a hard one. It's going to be an emotional one, as we've said. And I think a lot of our uncertainty is going to go away in that moment. And I think we would hope that we would be able to accomplish all of our goals for next year. Every penny, every dollar matters. If we want to have an RE program, if we want to support our minister, to grow our congregation, it, it requires money. And every penny, every penny, it's a bottom line. We don't really want to use endowment funds. Of course, that's not our goal. But I understand that if we want to grow, we have to spend money. And we may have to either choose to pull money from the endowment to support our goals, or we need to cut back our goals. I don't have an answer for you yet, because we need to see where the numbers come out. The board needs to meet, and we need to present that to you. never run because my ringer was off. Okay, let me go back to where I was. Just lost my groove. Okay, as I was saying, we don't necessarily want to have to go into endowment funds. So if we choose not to go into endowment, that means things are going to have to get cut back. We might not have an RE program. We might not be able to afford it. I, I don't know where we would cut. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, well, we wouldn't do this or that. That's our conversation in the 17th. We'll have that conversation. The board is going to have some hard things to decide before we get there. Okay. I get that budgets are tight. I hate asking, but I hope that we can pull a little extra bit of money out of our pockets here and there to get as close to our goal as possible. If you haven't given in a while, then I'm going to ask, please consider donating, even if it's 100 bucks. Every dollar matters. I also acknowledge that stewardship is so much more than just financial. We really do continue to need support for worship and coffee hour and ushering. If you can't write a check, help whatever we need. We need to survive and thrive. And I know there's lots of people out there supporting us, even if they're not sitting here on Sunday. I know there's tons of people out there supporting us continually and doing the work behind the scenes, and I appreciate that. So please donate all you can with your time, talent, and treasure. All are needed for our church to prosper. If you choose to pledge today, please see me, and we'll get a form filled out for you today if you have not already pledged. And for those who that have pledged, I thank you from my heart. You can mail your financial gift to the First UU Church, P.O. Box 494 in Alton 62002, or you can give electronically on Giveify or PayPal. Those links are available on our church webpage. If you're willing to donate your time or talent, let us know. We'll, we'll put you to work, no problem. Okay, so please join in our offering prayer. May this offering equip us to inspire love and to seek justice. So a couple of announcements. Always do things to announce. As you know, as I said, Ron Glossop's wife uh, passed away this week. Um, there will be a memorial service for her on July 18th at 10 a.m. at the nursing home. I will make sure the details go out in the newsletter. With um, Mary, we'll make sure that gets out when she gets back. Um, that'll have all those details in it. Um, I want to congratulate Eric Johnson and his fiancée, Robin, who got engaged not long ago. 
Um, there was some good news out there also that I remembered. Like, oh, I got to remember to share that good news, and I totally forgot about it. Any good news anybody wants to share? Because I really need some good news right now. Anybody? Something good? Yes, Brenda's here. That's always amazing news. Thank you. For those of you that don't know Brenda, she and her husband Willis were members here. Yay! So even if you don't know Brenda and you want to join us for lunch afterwards, we're going to the Bluff City Grill. Yes, thank you, Mary. We're going to Bluff City right after services and chit-chatting and stuff like that. So we'll do that. So please come and join. Get to know this beautiful person uh, whom I love and I, and I still love. And my little cards that I get every time a good holiday comes up, I get my Brenda card. I'm like, oh, it's Brenda. Yay! <laughs> Anything else? Tom, how's your wife? Is she doing okay? That, uh, yes, I hear you there. So yes, but so but she seems to be doing okay. So that's a good thing. Okay, good. It wasn't worse than you thought. I know his wife was had some surgery and was not feeling well. Pat, how's how's the new place we're in? <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Well, you know, I'm I'm post COVID now, so I will I can come and help unpack if that helps. Maybe sometime this week. Maybe we'll see. We'll talk. We'll figure out whatever kind of help you need. We got people that can help. I also want to just rec you know say that you know Aiden and Heather are sort of having a sort of a handful of time at home, and actually Aiden twisted his ankle and banged his head yesterday, so he's not in a good place either. So these are our beloved community. If anybody can help with a meal or whatever, even if you can't cook, you want to donate for takeout, we'll order takeout for them. I've already got a couple of donations in mind for that. So if we can help Aiden and Hedda, that would be fabulous because they not only have their kids, the accidental triplets, they also have um, their tiny raptor and then tiny raptor's littlest uh, child, uh, littlest sibling who's under a year. So they have a house full of babies and it's and it's uh, hard work. And they're, if anybody's had babies, you know it's exhausting. Yes, Paula. She's at Meridian. Yeah, re yeah. thank you for that reminder. Robin Crane moves into um, assisted living now, or, or is it independent living or assisted living? I think it's independent living or assisted living at, uh, at Meridian. So she's getting support there. Visits at any time. I think Peg Flack and I are going to go try to see her this week. So it's, it's wonderful. You know, you can sit down and eat lunch with them, visit. It's just really flexible. So, um, so that would be good news. I remember the other good news. So thank you for that because that triggered the memory. Um, Allison Ryehelt, for those of you that remember Allison, she got promoted to full professor. So yay for Allison. Yay. So we're excited about that. So lots of good things going on out there. Let's hold on to those good things. They're precious because... Those are the good things that get us through the really tough times. We have to, and it's okay, right, that we celebrate good things because even when things are hard, celebrating good things is really the thing that gets us through. We know from relationship research, and Paula, I know you're a science social worker, you get this, right? When we give, when we have negative things in our life, we have to counterbalance it with at least five things or more that are positive to counterbalance that because those negative things can really be harmful and can hurt us. All right. Anything else? If, you, if you're not on the newsletter, I mean, most everybody here should be on the newsletter, so I think we're good there. Um, but anybody listening, if you want to be on the newsletter, email the church and we'll get you on the newsletter list. Um, if you need a badge, anything like that, let me know. Anything else? Okay. So I want you to join me in extinguishing the tower. Snuffy thing. Oh, I'm working on that because not having, I, this was a surprise because I was actually talking to the city's attorney a couple weeks ago. She's like, I'm going to look into this. I'll get back to you because we're trying to figure out where that boundary is going to be. And they're already encroaching in that boundary and they've ripped up our sidewalk. We cannot get across. Poor Brenda trying to get in here. I mean, I, I, I had known we could have done something different. I'm so upset about that. But they didn't even warn us to say, hey, guess what? Your handicapped accessibility is gone. I don't think that the city cares about us, to be perfectly blunt. You think? Oh, I don't think that they do at all. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to let that sit there. Just know that I am angry and that I'm working on things. Professionally, of course, but nonetheless pissed off. Now I'm ready to extinguish. 
The light of truth and meaning cannot be put out. We are keepers of this flame until we meet again. I am going to keep that flame a brew. Our closing words, number 605 in our gray hymnal by Chung Yung. Oh, how great is the divine moral law in humanity, vast and illimitable. It gives birth and life to all created things. It towers high up to the very heavens. How wonderful and great it is. All the institutions of human society and civilizations, laws, customs, and usages have their origin there. Humanity, bodily autonomy is what matters. Have a blessed day. I will allow Joy next to go with our postman. Joy for your beautiful music. All right, everybody. Well, we've got some snacks. Thank you, Mary, for bringing stuff. I brought donuts. Yay. Um, so please come and enjoy us for some snacks and some coffee. And then anybody wants to go for lunch, please join us. Please. If, even if you don't know Brenda, she's amazing. So come and join and have some fun.